there's a difference between being accepted and being wanted, uh, being accepted and being loved. Uh, as I, I've used the illustration before that when I was younger in school, in gym class, I was one of the last ones to be selected, and I didn't feel wanted or accepted. And as I began to primarily to defend myself against bullies, got into sports and weightlifting, by the time I left high school, I was one of the first ones chosen in gym class for different events. And that was a very different feeling. In both scenarios, I was accepted by a team. In the first scenario, I wasn't wanted on the team. I was kind of a default member of the team. But in the second scenario, I was wanted by a team. I was, if you will, loved by a team. And last week we saw that we are accepted by God, but I want us to drill in a little bit in what we touched on, and that is that not only are we accepted by God, but we are loved and wanted by that God. And we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12 this morning, where it begins by saying, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So the first thing I want us to see this morning is this new command in verses 7 and 8. A new command. We said, Beloved, let us love one another. Now, if you were to go back to 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 7, it says, Beloved, I'm writing you no new command, but an old commandment that you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new commandment that is true in him and in you. So which is it, John? Is it a new commandment or is it not a new commandment? It is both. This new command to love one another is an old commandment because it's been in the law from the very beginning. It's in the old covenant, so that any Jewish person should have known the old commandment to love one another. But we also have, in this word new, this word kainos in the Greek, it can also mean new as in unused or unworn. It's always exciting if you go to a thrift store and you find a shirt that you really like and all the tags are still on it. It's new. Now, it's not new because obviously somebody owned it and it eventually wound up in a thrift store, but it's new in that it's never been worn. It's unused. And this is what John's communicating, that this isn't new information, but it's a commandment that has yet to be worn out. It's a commandment that is yet to be fully implemented in the lives of people. And so again, as he comes back to chapter 4, he says, Beloved, let us love one another. Let us agape one another. This self-sacrificing love for one another. Why? He says in verse 7, because love is from God. The word from means to go out of, to go forth from. Love emanates from God. And so John is saying, if we are people who love and worship God, if we are people who follow Jesus Christ, and if love emanates from the heart of God, that love too should be emanating from our hearts. And so, beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. And then he goes on to say that everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. In other words, John says, this is a proof that you belong to God. This is a proof that you are a follower of Christ, that everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. It's the proof that we are truly born again, that we are born from God because we have the heart of God for those around us, and that heart is love. And the word for know here isn't an intellectual knowledge because in the West, we've made the separation between what we know and what we embrace. There are certain things that we know, yet it makes no difference in our lives. I know that 
you can bungee jump and not die. I'm not doing it. I know it's a thing that can be done and people have fun doing it. I'm not doing it. It's a knowledge that does not impact my life. We can think about historical events or historical figures and say, I know that that event happened. I know that that person existed, but it really makes no difference in my life today. And sometimes it's easy for us to fall into the space of intellectual ascent of God. It doesn't say everybody who intellectually knows that there's a God, but knows it's a Jewish idiom for an intimate relationship. Everyone who relationally knows God loves. Because if you know God and know the heart of God and know his love, that love will be reflected in us as his followers. But in verse 8, he says, whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. In other words, he says, not only is love proof that we belong to God, that we've been born of God, but a failure to love is a failure to know God. Failure to love is failure to know God. He says, because God is love. Remember when your parents told you to be careful of who your friends are? Be careful of the company that you keep, because if you hang out with the bad kids, then they're going to... Uh, have an impact on you but if you hang out with the good crowd they're going to have an impact on you and you become like the people you surround yourself with i think what john is saying is if you hang out with god if you surround yourself with god you are going to become more and more like him by the holy spirit And so one proof of that one demonstration of that is the love that we have in our hearts for those around us if we don't have that John says, it kind of shows that we're not hanging out with God. So we have this new command to love one another. Number two, we have the display of love. The display of love in verse 9. Where it says, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. God's love was revealed among us in this way. The word revealed there means to make the unknown visible, whether by words or deeds. So God makes the unknown visible. He makes this unknown, unseen love, and he makes it real. He makes it tangible. And how does God make his love real and tangible? By sending Jesus into the world. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. This is the heart of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. And listen to what Matthew chapter 10, verse 30 says. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. Not only does God love us so much, he sent Jesus to die for us. But think about that love. It's not just a generic general love. It's so specific that he knows the number of hairs on your head. Some of us try to help him out, make it a little easier. By the way, the average is 100,000. I fall far short of that. But if you have the average head of hair, you've got about 100,000 hairs on your head, and God knows every single last one of them. Now, think of the person you love most in this world. The human being that you is the object of your greatest affection other than Jesus. Do you know exactly how many hairs are on their head? Do they have 100,000? Do they have 99,999? God knows. He knows that about you. Think about the details about the person you love most in this world. The details you don't know about. God knows those details. See, the only reason you learn the details of a person is because you love them. God knows the details of you. Not just the number of hairs on your head, but he knows your every thought, your every desire. He knows everything there is to know about you. 
And I love this picture we get of the city of Jerusalem, God's chosen city, God's chosen people. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, where it says, He will renew you in His love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. How does that sit with you? How does that fit with your perception of God? To think of God not only as this all-powerful, holy judge and creator of all things, but this God who looks down on his chosen people and breaks into song. I've never broken out into song. I don't know what that's like. I watch musicals where sometimes they feel the need to express a feeling through song. But I've never been so overcome with emotion, I just start singing. You know, in scratching my dog's ear, I've never burst forth into this melody of affection for my dog. God looks upon his chosen people and just starts singing. And not just singing. Because I, I love that it gives the descriptor. Because I know what it's like when you're in church and there's people close to you and you're like, I don't sing very well. And so you kind of sing at a very minimum. It says God sings with loud singing. He doesn't care who hears it. He wants to sing that song of love over the object of his affection. A love so strong. He sent his son to redeem us. What kind of love is that? What kind of love makes that kind of sacrifice for people who at the time want nothing to do with him? And that's the third point, the ultimate act of love. The ultimate act of love, verses 10 through 12. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. John says, look, it's not a big deal that we love God. We should love God. Because it's not like we're the ones up at the throne of God saying, please love us, please love us. It's God looking at fallen humanity and saying, I declare my love for you. And that while you are still sinners, while you want nothing to do with me, I'm going to make the ultimate sacrifice of my son for you. Romans chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Where it says, indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The, the means of appeasing the punishment that is due to our sins. Jesus took all of it upon himself. Before I had you think about the person that has the greatest affection in your heart. Think about the person you dislike the most in this world. So I don't hate anybody. The person you dislike the most. The person with whom you least like to spend time. How much do you love them? Do you love them enough to make the ultimate sacrifice for them? Because that's what scripture says God did for us. It says that we were enemies of God. And while we were still in that sin, that's when God displayed his love by sending Jesus to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so verse 11, Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. Since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another with the same love that God has loved us with. We're to love one another. Three quick observations about just what we've seen about that love, about that agape love. First of all, it's self-sacrificing. God is the one who sacrificed in order for us to receive his love, for us to be brought into relationship with him. He didn't require the sacrifice from us. He took the sacrifice upon himself when Jesus went to the cross for our sins. God's love is self-sacrificing. 
See, very often when somebody hurts us or offends us, we want them to pay the price for what they did to us. Whether that's holding a grudge, being bitter against them, not forgiving them, we want them to pay a price. God's self-sacrificing love, he paid the price himself. Second thing about that love, not only is it self-sacrificing, but that love acted first. God's love acted first. He didn't wait for us. God didn't sit back and say, I'm willing to forgive and love, but I need you to come crawling back to me. God said, I'm going to go get you. I'm going to go get you and bring you back to myself. I am going to act first. I'm not going to sit idly by. And a lot of times we are so frequent to withhold love. Thinking that, well, when they come back to me, when they apologize, when they re reconcile to me, then I will love them. God acted first. It's a love that's self-sacrificing, a love that acted first, and a love that forgives freely. Do you know that there's no sin that we can confess to God that he will not forgive? Nothing. No sin so great, no sin so horrific that God refuses to forgive us. And so that love says of us, no matter what somebody does to you, be willing to forgive. Because God's love was self-sacrificing, it acted first and it forgives freely. And so John says, we also ought to love in the same way. We ought to self-sacrificingly love one another, first actingly love one another, forgiving freely one another. The final point is the proof of God. The proof of God in verse 12. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. No one's ever seen God. Fair point. A true point. Even Moses could only see the afterglow of God's presence. He said, Moses, if, if I show you my face like you're asking, you would die. So I'll let you see the after effect of my presence. No one's ever seen God. Now, notice how John doesn't say, since no one's ever seen God, really hunker down on your apologetics and your uh, your theology of creation and science and debate with somebody that there's a God. Because here's a lesson I've learned the hard way in street ministry that you can have all of the arguments for the existence of God and you can tap into science and all these other things and the person you're talking to will always have another objection. And you will spend hours going around and around and around and around. Are there exceptions? Yes. But by and large, you can't argue somebody into the kingdom. But John says, no one's ever seen God. In a sense, he's saying, but if we love one another, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected or made full or completed in us. What's John saying? He's putting these two thoughts together, saying, nobody's ever seen God, but if we love like God, people will see God in us. So if people doubt the existence of God, when they see our love, that will change their minds. They will see a reflection of God in us. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. He said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. He didn't say let your light shine and, and beat people over the head or argue with people or just raise every possible point you can raise. He says, let your light shine so that when they see your good works, when they see your life, when they see your love, they give glory to your Father in heaven. That because they see a glimpse of God in us, they're open to the reality of God. Now, there, there's a lot more that could be unpacked with that, but this is what John is saying. No one's ever seen God. But if we love like God, we can show God to the world. 
So what does this love? 1 Corinthians 13 gives such a beautiful description and uh, for this uh, kind of his commentary, but I love how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message. He says, if I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Doesn't have a swelled head. Doesn't force itself on others. Isn't always me first. Doesn't fly off the handle. Doesn't keep score of the sins of others. Doesn't revel when others grovel. Takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. Puts up with anything. Trust God always. Always looks for the best. Never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. 1 Corinthians 13 is a beautiful portrait of the love of God. The love of God that is meant to be reflected in and through us. So there's three ways I feel like we could respond to this. And the first way is maybe this morning you need to receive the Father's love. Because it, it's very easy for us to grow up in the church or spend years in the church. And our definition of God suddenly becomes confined to this all-powerful, strict dictator who is always watching us, ready for us to trip so that he can discipline us. Is there truth in that? Yeah. Yeah. Is that a full picture of God? No. Because God is love. Sometimes we're not that great about simply receiving the Father's love. You may have been a Christian for 50 years, but you've never really experienced the love of your Heavenly Father. This morning, maybe you need to receive the Father's love. Second of all, maybe you need to renew your love for Jesus. Remember what Jesus said to the church at Ephesus. You're doing everything right. You're believing everything you're supposed to believe, but you've lost your first love. And because of that, I'm going to shut you down. Again, it's really easy for us to be Christians and lose sight of Jesus. Jesus. Because there's a lot of things about the Christian life. We can suddenly make the Christian life about church and serving at church and reading Christian books, listening to Christian radio, not doing this, not doing that. And somewhere along the way, love for Jesus stops being a motive. It, it becomes just the thing you're supposed to do or the right thing to do. Not making God angry. And it stops being an overflow of love for Jesus. And maybe this morning you'd be willing to say, my love for Jesus has gone a little flat. It's not my greatest motivator anymore. Something else is. This morning, maybe you need to receive the Father's love, renew your love for Jesus, or lastly, restore your love for others. Is God calling you to restore the love you have for those around you? See, again, sometimes just like the Ephesians, and we say, well, when Jesus warned Ephesus, he was talking about their love for him. Yeah, but it doesn't specifically say that. It says first love. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God with everything you have, but there's another side of that coin, and that's love your neighbor as yourself. Is it possible it wasn't just the Ephesians' lack of love for Jesus, but lack of love for one another? 
Sometimes we can be so determined to be right that we fail to be loving. Sometimes we so want to win an argument that we no longer care about being loving. Have you noticed your love for others becoming cold, becoming distant? Do you notice yourself being less compassionate to those around you? As we swim in this ocean of God's grace, there's a fundamental principle of his love. That if we want to show God's love to the world, we first need to know and experience his love for ourselves. If we want to show grace to the world, we have to first understand and receive that grace for ourselves. This morning, do you need to receive the Father's love? Renew your love for Jesus or restore your love for those around you. I know that we typically end with an altar call, and, and you can still do that at the end of the service to come forward for prayer, but as I close the message in prayer, I want to invite you, and you don't have to specify, but if you feel like one of those three things applies to your heart, I just want you to stand as I pray. I can just pray over you that whatever aspect